did really good. Well, you've joined us here to, uh, to explore um, the teachings of Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha. And we've come a long way in his teachings, and we've explored the ten worlds, <coughs> uh, the ten aspects of the mind that he taught about. But then, what his career was built around, and which many people don't understand, Buddha was not here to, to start a religion any more than Jesus was. Buddha appeared on the scene to show you how to overcome suffering. That, that was his commission, to help people overcome suffering, whatever kind of suffering that might take. And he wrote what is called the Sutra, Lotus Sutra, as you got the Bible, uh, the Hindus, the Vedas, the uh, Muslims, the Quran, in Buddhism, it's the Sutra is, is what he wrote. And he said that in suffering there are three poisons, and that's the subject. There are three poisons that infect every living human being and are the prime cause of human suffering. And he said what they were. Now, to understand this, and I think you'll get a kick out of this in a minute, this was written a thousand years before Jesus was born. Okay? And Buddha said that the three poisons in every human being which cause suffering are greed, anger, and you're really going to get a kick out of this next one. Stupidity. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Here's, did you know that? Is that I mean, it's just amazing. Shakyamuni Buddha listed the three poisons in the lives of people that cause our problems. Greed, anger, and stupidity. <laughs> Maybe it was one of his more frustrating times, you know, trying to deal with people. But... What, what he said was, if you look, if, in other words, if everybody was transparent, if people could see inside of you, everyone would see these three things oozing through your body like an infection because everybody has them. Everybody wants, everybody gets angry and, you know, freaks out, and all of us are really stupid, you know, <laughs> really stupid. When you think of uh, some creator somewhere says, hey, look, I'll, I'll build this planet and I'll stick it right now. I'll make it the nicest place in the universe and you'll only have mountains and rivers and lakes and streams and birds. I'll make it really neat. I'll make funny looking things like giraffes and hippopotamus. They can have a lot of fun. In the and, we, and we destroy it, you know, and we use it to, to launch missiles at one another. It's stupid. Just absolutely stupid. But those are the three poisons. So what Buddha said you must do and, and this is something we'll be getting into as we go along in these teachings. He said you must chant Nam Mi Oho Renge Kyo. Okay, whoops. That should be K-Y-O, just believe it is, all right? And basically, and, and as we'll go into it later, what that means is reverence for the invisible within you or the spirit which manifests itself in the physical and to understand the law of cause and effect. That nothing you are doing now happens by itself. Everything that you do is because somebody placed a cause within you and it is now having its effect. Nothing happens without a cause. If you're miserable, something happened to cause you to be miserable. If you have a, 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 you know, if, if you have a violent temper, there's a reason that you do. And he said, once you understand the cause and effect, then you can deal with it. See, that's what's like um, the people that wrote on our building that all over the door they had spray paint, uh, Satan pit, this is the devil's den and all. I mean, you know, it's a strange fact. We don't even believe in that stuff, you know. And, and this here is what Buddha was saying. That's what gets you in trouble because then you, you pass your problems on to some, you know, imaginary figure somewhere and you never look within yourself and find out where it really comes from. What is the cause because of the effect? And that's it's a key, which comes out under the lips that manifests itself from God. So he says, if you begin to understand this and chant that, and it, because, you see, your mind does not understand necessarily only English. It's a universal thing. So as your, your mind starts to plug in this, that you are looking for the invisible of the spirit within you to manifest itself within you, you realize the law of cause and effect and God, then as you begin to do that, he says, then you can meet the poisons head on. See? But basically, 
what Shakyamuni Buddha taught is that we, 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 we are self-poisoning ourselves. We, we play the part in poisoning ourselves. See? See, what happens, for instance, your anger. Many, many of us have terrible anger. And it, and, it, and it constantly seeds within ourselves, uh, in, in our mind, the, these things speak to us. And if you'll notice something, it's very interesting. When you are with people, you're not angry. You're not. You, you know, you're, if, if you have somebody to dump on or talk to, you're not angry. If, you're, if you have somebody over to your house, you know, you listen to records or uh, you, you watch TV or something, it's fine. Only when you're alone does it start again. When you're alone, that starts within you and starts to create a fire within you, and you get ticked off. Really, and, and, and basically that's what Shakyamuni taught. That being with people, it's fine. And the reason he says this has happened is this. What has happened is the anger and the fear and the hate and the guilt which has been placed in you by others since the time as a child or a previous life, we have pushed those things so far deep down into the unconscious that when other people are around us, we can't hear it. But when we're by ourselves and alone, we can hear the screaming from the cellar. Okay? It's because it is so deeply ingrained and rooted in our nature that it is deep down, and when other people are around us, we can't hear. You can go out to a restaurant and you can be fine. You can drop the person off you're with, or they drop you off, you get home alone, and you're in a rage within yourself. You're frightened, you're angry, you're guilty, and all of these types of things. Because when you're with others, they distract you from it. But when you're with alone, you hear what's coming out of the subconscious. And basically, it's not good. Okay? This is from a man <laughs> that you know, we've been taught to avoid. This is from a man who, 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 who taught this to us a thousand years before Jesus Christ was born. Trying to teach people how to overcome suffering. And you know, if you walk into many of the churches, or if you try to teach the, talk to the people who sprayed the paint on the wall, oh, this is evil. This is evil. And yet they are suffering from the very things that he says. Somebody has to come lurking in the dark of night, spray something on and run like blazes in Jesus' name, you know, to, to do damage. Because there's something within them. They're filled deep within themselves with this hurt and this screaming. If you have a Bible, and you do because there's nobody, none of them left on the tables back there, that means we have to order, okay? Uh, Matthew chapter 8 on page 8. Matthew chapter 8. Th this, is, this is summed up beautifully right here, okay? What happens to you? You get into a situation where, you know, somebody comes, you're fine, everything is great, but by yourself, these things which are rooted in your subconscious are tormenting you. You, you lay in bed and they come in, you, you sit by yourself, you're watching television and you'll start to get these thoughts in your head and it never leaves you alone. And generally it always has something back with with something when you were a child. Because the child who is within you is the one who's been hurt. The child who is within you has been hurt by somebody, sometime. See, we have a, we have a lovely young lady who comes here who is about to have a, a child. What a lucky, beautiful child that is. Because that child who has not even seen the light of day, I know because of its mother, will never have to undergo the fear, the hurt, and the guilt of devils and demons and all of that stuff. It will be raised with the love of God, with the love of Jesus, with the love of nature. And I'm talking about Kimberly, and she just looks magnificently beautiful. Uh, when's it due? Two to four weeks, hopefully two. Oh, okay. okay. That'll be great. So, but you see, what I'm saying is, that is, she is not going to place into that child's head these guilts and negative things that are then going to fester down into the roots, which can cause a, a, a very difficult life. So many of you can look back at what has been put in your head even by your parents. And these things have festered out now and have got you trapped. Um, John Bradshaw, I remember when John Bradshaw said one time, he said, screaming at a child can cause a change in the electromagnetic fields of that child's brain and that child can be in trouble for the rest of its life. Just screaming at a child can do that. We don't understand these things because we have not listened to the people that God sent. How many of you, you have, to, you have to be true about this, how many have you have ever listened to Shakyamuni Buddha before you came to this room? Never, ever, ever. Yet God sent him to teach us how to overcome suffering. He was part of the umbilical cord of, of Krishna and Jesus and Buddha. Krishna came down to show us the spirit realms of the mind. Buddha came down to show us how to live with our mind. Jesus came down, take it to us as Lord, and gave us the directions of how to use all of this God-giving thing. But anyhow...
On, on page 8, Matthew chapter 8, and verse uh, 28, what happens here is that Jesus comes into the other side of the country in Gergenes, and he met two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. And they cried out, what do you have to do with us? Verse 29. And it was a good way off swine. So the 31, the devil sought him, suffer us to go away into the herd. And in verse 32, go, and they went into the herd of swine. What that's talking about is not Jesus coming into a graveyard and two people running out of the tombs and then, and then devils jumping out of them and jumping into pigs and the pigs jumping over the moon and all of this stuff. This is all parable. This is symbol. This is heavy, mystical, spiritual stuff you read here. But do you know, 99% of the people who read that believe that two guys come out of the tombs and the devils jumped out, jumped into the pigs. What the heck did they do to anybody? The pigs jumped over the moon, and that's the end of that. For what? What did the pigs do? I mean, in the first place, we got Jesus destroying property. These pigs didn't belong to him. What did they belong to? And what are you going to drive a pig now? Can you imagine a beautiful pig? All he wants is, hey, I love the mud. I love the slop. Let's slop around. Hey, this is great. Oink, oink. What does he want with our troubles? They don't need our troubles. See? What I'm saying to you is the animal kingdom does not need to be soiled with this kind of stuff. This is mysticism. What it is saying is the graveyard is your mind. The tombs of the subconscious. And the things that I'm talking about are lurking in the subconscious. When the beautiful Lord Jesus Christ comes with his teachings and light into the graveyard of your mind, he brings out of you, out of the tombs of the subconscious, those fears and those guilts and those hurts. And once they're brought into the light, then they can be driven out and they're driven back into the lowest pits of the earth, which are symbolized by the swan. Wait a minute now. You can't just, you, there's people. Come on. Come on. Come on. No, there's people watching. Oh, she hates to be on top. Yeah, but I'm so comfortable. <laughs> I just wanted to say that pigs of the animal kingdom are supposed to have the highest intelligence, so mm -hmm. God can be talking about our intelligence, too, doing okay. that to us. Good. That's a good. Hey, you know what? She just said something here. Let me just go away for a second and, and change it. for. I want to share you something. The last uh, three days, I was at a conference for my work, and it was, it's conducted by a psychologist, Dr. Rich Petrino. And he teaches a lot of this stuff, how to get along with people from a practical standpoint and so forth. And he did something which I want to share with you because it's really, really interesting. And it, boy, ring a bell and I, and I wrote it down. I'm, I'm veering away from the subject for a minute, but this is good. And I don't want to forget about it. And you might want to write this down. He was telling us about becoming one with other people, experiencing other people to the fullest. And he said, there is a method in psychology called harage, H-A-R-A-G-E, and it's Japanese, okay? It was formed by a Japanese psychologist. Harage means getting into another person's stomach. And what rang a bell with me instantly, Jesus Christ said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. He must get into your stomach because the ancient Eastern philosophy is that you become one with another person when you can get into their stomach. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that good? So there you find, you find the roots of Jesus saying, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, comes from an ancient Eastern philosophical or psychological precept in which they called it getting in. You might say, hey, you know, I'm really, you're really getting him on my nerves or you know, he's really getting in my skin, getting under my skin. They said, you must get into another person's stomach in order to be one with that person and to work with that person in a harmonious way. And Jesus is saying, I've got to get into your stomach. And that way you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Harage, which is Japanese. Isn't that good? Well, I just wanted to throw that at you because what uh, uh, Joan and Johnny were talking about, the swine and what these things symbolize, you know, and how it can be used. So there then, when you look back to what Buddha was talking about, understand, think for just a moment while you're sitting here, okay? And, and many of you don't even have to think because while you're sitting here, you're hearing those things talk to you. You've, you've already been in communication. Since you've come in and sat down in this room, you've been in communication with these things. You know, you got to do this, you got to do that, I got to do the other thing, I got to do the other, blah, 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 you know, for what? You know, sometimes you have people come into meditation and then, you know, I'll, I'll, they'll be here about 10 minutes, they got to get up, they got to leave. Why? Where are they going? What in God's name is there out there that is going to, for what? what, what where are you going to go? And they, you know what they're going to? They're going to get up and they're going to walk up the stairs and then they're going to look out in the front and look for something to do. You know why it is? You can't sit still with yourself. You bore yourself. You are absolutely bored with being by yourself. You can't deal with it. 
And then you wonder why nobody likes you. Who wants to hang around? If you can't hang around with yourself, who the heck else wants to hang around with I don't want to hang around with myself. I've been sitting with myself for 10 minutes. That's all I can take. I'm getting out of here. I've got to find somebody to yell at or yell at me. You know, I'm going to get into the system. That's basically the problem. And that, that's one of the first things I learned in meditation. I remember, I guess it was Joel Goldsmith was talking about. He says, you want to see how difficult we are as far as our lives are concerned. Try to sit for 20 minutes by yourself. Just, just alone with yourself. Do nothing. And you, you'll get very bored and, and, and you'll, you'll quick, you've got to find something to do. You've got to go someplace. And yet if you, find, if you were to run out of this, but where would you go? What would you do? What, what can't wait 30 minutes? You know, what is it? And that's the secret of your life. That's called time, which is Kronos, which is Saturn, which is Satan. Time. And time, Satan. Did you ever see Father Time in the New Year's thing? He uses the sickle to castrate God. In other words, time prevents God from placing his seed in you because you're so doggone. I gotta be here, I gotta be there, can't go there because I gotta be somewhere. What am I gonna do? I don't know, but I gotta do it. Where am I gonna go? I don't know. When are you gonna do it? I don't know what I gotta do, but I gotta do it. Where am I gonna get home? To go nowhere. Spinning our wheels. And basically what we live like, you know, what are those things they have in gerbils and pet shops that run around in the thing? <laughs> gotta hurry up, gotta hurry up. And I went, where'd you go? I didn't go anywhere. You're on a Ferris wheel of life. And the Ferris wheel takes you to the top. Oh, it's magnificent. But just remember, the Ferris wheel will bring you back right to the same place where you started. And you'll get off. And then you look around for something else to get into. But it's all the same thing. See, what, what Buddha, Shakyamuni, taught us is that anger is not just screaming. It's far worse. It's resentment. Huh? See what happens when you have resentment upstairs here? That you, 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 know, you, you get so mad. You, you get so mad, you will not allow another person to disagree. See, you get so mad that you, you, you don't, you, you, it's, 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 it's a sin for another person not to agree with you. You're going to take action to prevent that. Today. It's resentment. It's critical attitudes and it's lack of respect. And that's why Jesus Christ says, physician, you've got to heal yourself. You've got to do something about it. Because i got news for you. You're getting older. And in each day, each month, time begins to run. When are you going to correct it? You say, well, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do know what to do. You sit on the floor and you meditate. That's what you do. That'll correct it. That will correct it. That will correct the situation. That's the only thing you can do. But Buddha philosophy is so beautiful. And this is what Shakyamuni Buddha said. If you're angry, your anger is spilling into you and it's poisoning you. And it's hurting your physical existence. It's the kind of thing that gives you disease, makes you sick. It's the kind of thing that disturbs your mind. It'll keep you from getting a good job. It'll keep you from having a happy relationship. It'll keep you from having nice children and all of the things. If you're having problems, which everybody does, he says what you have to do is expand your consciousness. And he says what you do is expand your consciousness in meditation for the happiness of other people. Meditate and visualize a person or another person that maybe you don't like and visualize that person in a beautiful way and pour happiness towards that person. Because Shakyamuni said, that will release the poison. Because if you're willing to meditate for the happiness of others, then you'll expand your consciousness to such an extent that you'll no longer be dominated by that greed and by that anger. And you'll be set free from it. Because your mind will do it and all the electronics within your mind will start to change and you'll start to feel differently. And it does work. It works. But you have to do it. But see, the easier way to do is to hand tracks around and say, say these magic words and you're going to be saved, you know. Unfortunately, Jesus never said that. The Bible doesn't say that and that does not work. That's not the way to do it. You've got to heal yourself and you've got to do it through meditation. See, you expand yourself to the whole. In other words, look where you, see, take your hands. You see, see what you, your whole, you know what your whole world is? Right here. How, how far is that across? You know, what is it? Ten inches or something like that? That's your whole it, world is there. Everything is kept inside of this container, this jar that's sitting on the top of your shoulders. Inside the jar on the top of your shoulders is everything in your existence. One of the great meditations Edgar Cayce did, and it's an amazing thing, sometimes tried at the beach, is he says, meditate, cut your head off. And what you do is you pretend that you don't have a head. And like there's a board right across here. And you, all of a sudden, like, you're, you're everything. 
Because the only thing that prevents you from being everything is the jar, the container that keeps you in here. Once you don't have a head, wow, like Joan said, down at the beach, we were at Cocoa Beach one time, she tried the meditation, she said, I became the seagull. I said, great, we can fly home and it won't cost us anything. <laughs> but she really did. I mean, when you're not in here anymore, then you are the seagull. Then you're one with everything. And you're one with the whole. So, remember I told you a long time ago, the little drop of dew coming out of the sky. A little insignificant drop of dew. That's what each one of us are. And we're coming down towards the ocean. And we say, oh, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to crash in the ocean and I'm going to die. But the little drop of dew crashes into the ocean and becomes the sea. Wow. Now I'm not something that'll just evaporate. I can make big ships go. I can carve out continents because I am one with everything. That's what Buddha was trying to say. Shakyamuni Buddha put it in a beautiful way. And he said, if you take a little drop of ink and put it in a glass, it makes all the water blue. This is our little glass and the little drop of ink is every little trouble, every little irritant. But he said, if you take that same drop of ink and put it in the ocean, it disappears. Isn't that pretty? Do you see what he's saying? So when you come in and you meditate, you're coming into the whole, you're coming into the universe. And all of those little irritants then are like little drops of ink into the ocean. They mean nothing. It becomes beautiful, see. So you expand to that oneness and you see that anger was used to keep people separated. You see, in the past, and that's what we've gone through in this new age, that same anger that was suddenly, now it's being redirected to, to bring people together. And it's going to be tough. There's a lot of people resenting it. I mean, you, you see what's happening now? The new phenomenon, racial bias, I mean, attacks on people all over the place. And this is part of it upstairs that we had. It's part of it. I was telling Dave, called me. Dave and I talked about it. I said, well, Dave, you being black, you understand it better than we do. I said, I've been subjected to it forever. But that's exactly the same thing. It's people that can't let go of these old ways, and there's something that is changing them. So what all of this is telling you, see, is that Listening to Buddha is listening to Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. The kingdom of God is within you. Meditating and chanting these chants. And if you, go, you can go to a Christian church and say, talk in tongues. Well, go ahead. Now me oho ringe keo. Talk in tongues. I don't it's, it's easy to interpret. I have reverence for that which is the invisible spirit which manifests itself. I understand that the causes that enter into me will produce the effects of my life. Because Shakyamuni Buddha says, if you want to know what your life was like in the past, take a look at what your life is like now. And if you want to know what your life is going to be like in the future, take a look at what your life is now. And if it's not what you like it to be, change it through the power of that inner spirit. I don't know, I don't think I've ever read or studied a more, you know, we talk about Carl Jung. I think Carl Jung would get a run from his money by Shakyamuni Buddha, who never went to college. He was a magnificent person. And he taught of disciplining yourself and redesigning your conscious psyche. And, 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 and your energies, which are consumed with the survival of self, will start to change and be consumed with the survival of nature, the love of nature, the oneness with nature. Chanting, meditating, inner communion, new ways to solve old problems, new ways to understand Jesus Christ. That beautiful thing that comes to you from within. But here, then, what Buddha is teaching us is if anger is dominant, if greed is dominant, then there is a beautiful way. There's a beautiful way to leave Egypt. Let me tell you something. You read about the, the Jews leaving Egypt, right? Oh, they, they, they came out of Egypt 400,000 strong, and they got to the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parted, and they crossed over to the Promised Land, and all of this business, which there's no record, that means nothing to you. It doesn't mean anything to you because the bill collector's coming. It means nothing to you because the doctor's got your biopsy report. It means nothing to you because your kid didn't call last night. You don't know where they are. It means nothing to you because you got all kinds of problems. It means nothing to you because you can't find a job. It means nothing to you because you can't pay your bills. It means nothing to you because all of the things that are pounded upon you, you could care less of Moses crossed the Red Sea and a PT boat. What do you care? What's it going to do for you? But when you understand what it means, 
When you understand that Egypt is the lower carnal mind, and when you understand that you can force Pharaoh to let you go by allowing that Spirit of God to take over you, and you cross the desert of meditation, you come to the Red Sea of your turning emotions, and when your emotions try to drive you back, and all of your thoughts are bearing down on you to grab you by the neck and drive you back to the hell that you had, and you look up, to that higher dwelling place of Christ within you and that sea opens and you can crush that which is the carnal mind into that which is the holy promised land of the right side. When you understand that, then you're set free. Then you understand Exodus. Exodus has nothing to do with a bunch of people running across the desert. It has to do with you escaping from the bondage of yourself to the freedom of the Christ who dwells within you. Wasn't bad. And it's true. It's true. When those things are said like I just said them, I didn't say it. When those things are said like I just said that is channeled by Christ himself, screaming to you to get through your head with this means. Usually I stutter and stumble. When it comes through and it flows like that, I know where it's coming. Because the God who has created you loves you. The Christ who gave his blood for you wants you to know the truth that you're special. You're beautiful. You're the light of the world. The kingdom of God has been placed within you. Now let it out. Let it fly. Let the dove fly. Let it be good. It was a story that I loved about the church that, or the people or the universe that took the little dove because the dove was always the spirit and would spread his wings and would stop from each person to person and give you the life and give you the truth of who you are. You're such beautiful people. You're so great. I get to know each one of you, and I get so hurt by all of us who have been had so many troubles by this system and the guilt and the fear and all of this stuff, just like this crap up on the front of the book, of all of this which understand, misunderstanding Jesus Christ, a misunderstanding God. And they said they took this dove, and they wanted to honor it because it was the Holy Spirit, and they put it in a cage to give it a house. And they said, boy, the dove is beautiful. Let's make a bigger cage. And the cage got bigger and bigger, and they put jewels on it, and they put stained glass on it, and pretty soon the cage was more important than the dove. And they couldn't find it. And somebody remembered someday, where the heck is the dove? And they looked at the bottom of the cage, and the dove was dead. That's what's happened. Spirit doesn't mean anything. It's the system that means everything. System. And I guess maybe that's why I'm such a revolutionary, because I see so many of you that are hurt, if I could do something, if I could give you all a job that was if you were looking or hurt, I would. And I see what the system has done. And the reason that you're hurt is the cause is because the system has held you down. The system in concert with the government and with religion has convinced you that you can't do it, you can't make it. And where are they? Where are they? Nowhere. When people are trying so hard. It has to be a new time. So when I look at that newspaper thing of Bradley saying, I'm going to start thinking not only with my brain. He's a Rhodes Scholar from Princeton. I'm going to start thinking with my heart. I'm going to start thinking with intuition. You know what he means to think with intuition? You know what that guy said? Single eye. You know, that's what it is. It's the divine instinct inside. He's going to start thinking with that. He may not even know what he said. But God knows because somebody has touched him somewhere, somehow, within or without. He's been touched and he's starting to unravel himself from his intellectualism. In other words, he has moved from the west to the east. That is something to chant, God, thank God for that, because if you have people of that leadership quality who can all of a sudden say, there's more than my intellect, there's more than Princeton, there's something inside of me. The man said, he's a Rhodes Scholar, he says, I've got to start talking not just from my intellect, I've got to start talking from my instinct. Not only just what I know, but how I feel. Do you understand what that means? That's the new age. And I'll fight like hell to make that happen. And I am not afraid, and I hope you won't be afraid of anybody that would come to that front door because it just makes me mad and I'll just stand right here. And anybody can say to you, this is, you know what it says in this stupid thing? This track? You know what it says in this stupid thing? It says this new age is not the God of the Bible. How many of you got a Bible on your lap? How many of you, how many, you know what these, and you know what I found these things stuck? in the Bibles that were on the back table. When have you ever come in here that we did not open the Bible? When it, take any one of these churches, and I don't mean to not church it, but I'll take anybody, anywhere, anybody that have taught every, every line in the book of Matthew, every line in the book of Revelation, most of the stories of the Old Testament, it's all here, everything out of the Bible. 
And yet they say, oh, well, it's not the God of the Bible. We don't know who this is. Who wrote this? What kind of, what, what do we know, what kind of a problem is this person got? You know? Oh, well, he wrote it, so we'll hand it out. It's not right. Let's wrap this up, okay? What we understand here is that the energy of anger and greed gives way to a passion to help other people, and that's what it'll do. And Buddha taught that the ego inflates to such a degree that all one is ever able to do. And now listen to what he said. Listen to what he said a thousand years before Jesus. The ego gets to such a point that all one is able to do is blame the circumstances on somebody else. Even the devil. And Buddha said, that's the cause of your suffering. Because if you'll turn and look in here, you'll see there is a way out. And that the origin of this thing is because the infection has been placed within you. And you have to treat the infection within yourself. You cannot, and God, we have people here who have gone through such struggles in their health and with their bodies. And they'll be the first to tell you, you cannot treat that disorder by blaming it on somebody else. The doctor, and God bless them, and the nurses have to deal with it inside here. Those types of physical afflictions are just portrayers of those kind of mental and spiritual afflictions, but it's the same thing. That's why Jesus Christ said, Physician, heal yourself. So the sad part is that because the inflated ego, one doesn't even have an inkling that I could be fundamentally responsible. Do you, do you, do you want to think of that? You go, oh, you're could you think, maybe I'm responsible? Okay, so now that's great. That doesn't put you on a guilt trip. It just says, if I know where the seat of the problem is, I'm going to go after it. I've been chasing around after a devil. Rebuke him and he will flee. You've been rebuking him for 40 years. He ain't fleed. He's like, he's all over you like fleas. He doesn't flee. Why? Because he's me. What am I going to rebuke? Until I understand it's me. How do you rebuke him? Coming to Christ. How do you come to Christ? Raise your consciousness above. You rebuke the devil when you leave him. You come out of the cellar. He lives in the cellar. He lives in the tomb. He lives in the lower world. Don't you understand what hell is? Hell is down below. What's down below? The carnal mind. Where is heaven? Up above. What's up above? The holy mind. The divine mind. The Christ mind. So you dwell upstairs instead of downstairs. So to get away from the devil, you go to the upper room, which is the higher mind, the higher consciousness. And you sit at the right hand. What the heck is so stupid about it? Why isn't that so easy for everybody to understand? It's there. It's inside of you. Heaven is inside of you. Hell is inside of you. Depends what you want to let loose. It's just, remember, here you are. Here you are. Right? Right? There you are. Now, here comes the power. I'll make a different color. Here comes the power. This is the God power. Ooh. <laughs> Up there. Ooh. Okay, same power, only one power. <laughs> only one power, right? You hear what I'm saying to you? Jill, you pay attention? One power. I'm teasing her because she is. But the power that comes down, we give the name, that power that comes down to the lower is hell. We give the name to the power that comes to the higher is heaven. It's the same power. See? I mean, I mean if, if you're swimming and you don't know how to get along in deep water, the water can become hell because it can kill you. If you know how to swim in it, you know, my little... I put a little tube around me so that way I, you know, plop up and down and the water makes you feel good. But it's the same water. And you can't say the part of the water is the devil in the water because you drowned. No, there isn't. You don't know how to swim. You can't say, well, you know, some of the guys come in here. Or Mike, we were putting, a, Mike was in charge of putting the building up. Oh, I can do this. And I, you know, Mike would say, well, yeah, better not. Because, you know, you get somebody in here and say, I'll, I'll install the electricity for you. Next thing you know, there's fire engines out in front of the building. What happened? What happened to the building? Where to go? What? It wasn't that the electricity was the devil. The guy messing with it didn't know how to touch it. He made it the devil. But the same lights are heaven. So here comes the same power. There's not two powers. There's not a devil and God. 
There's only God. But if you don't know how to use God's power, you're going to get burned. But if you use God's power right, what happens? You turn everything upside down. Hey, see? No. Hey, got to be. Yeah. But that's what it is. It's just the one power. It's not two powers. See, don't be afraid of a devil anymore, okay? Let's put that out of our... There is no devil. The devil is that power that we misuse. It's the one... That's why God says, I create good and create evil. Because it depends how you use it. Okay? If you use your car, how about... if You, you can get in your car, can take you to California, can take you to Disneyland... You could go all over nice places. Or you could, you could pull out of here and drive into a pole. It's the same car. The same car that took you to Disneyland is the same car that drove you into the pole. Oh, why? Because you didn't know how to use it. You screwed up. You were using it wrong. You did something wrong. You should see me when I do things around the house. I don't do them anymore. One time, there was a leak in the sink. There was a leak in a pipe under the sink. Okay? So I said, don't worry, wife. I'll fix it. I figure if there's a hole in the pipe, plug it up, right? So what did I do? I figured a hole is a little, so I'll take a nail, which is, you know, and I'll... <laughs> and I did, and I put a nail in the hole. Well, you know, what happened? You can't blame the pipe. You can say the pipe's the devil because water came all over the place. No, I misused the power, and I had water all over the place. So Joan, being the loyal wife that she is, ran to the phone to call her brother. I said, don't you dare tell him who put, I couldn't get the nail out. Don't. He's, <laughs> he's under there, he's under there, and what's he saying under there? Who the hell put the nail in there? I said, I don't know, you can't trust anybody anymore. And I said, don't you, don't, you, don't you tell who put the nail. Well, you don't know what you're doing, you screw everything up. All I'm saying to you is get rid of this fear of devils and demons and understand there is only one power and that one power is Almighty God. Good power. There is only one Christ and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only... But you misuse their power and you're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. You misuse the power. I can tell you of a lot of things I've done. What? Yes! <laughs> Wait a minute. That's right. What's going on? Yes. There it is. Thank you. A prophecy. Shakyamuni. Stupidity. That's what he was, exactly what he was talking about. Exactly what he was talking about. He said, you have been told how to use the power, and you've misused it, and you got hurt. That's exactly what he was talking about. And, 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 and you, 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 <laughs> I can't even get out of that one. <laughs> but, but look, let, let, let me go to the very last page. Because Emil raised it, and it's true, and it's what I'm talking to you about. It's stupidity. You know, it is stupidity. Because have you ever done anything around a house, and then somebody says, well, why the heck didn't you call so-and-so? He could have, I don't know. Because you were stupid. I was stupid. When we misused the power. But now let me finish this with, with, with stupidity. I promise you it'll only be a couple minutes. Jesus says you can do what he did. Okay? This, I'm telling you, I, I follow Jesus Christ to the letter. I do not say what he did not say. I do not do what he did not say to do. What he says to do, I do. What he says to say, I say. He said, look, Bill, you tell these people that they can do everything I did. They can do better than I did. I want you to believe that. It is stupid to take the words of Jesus Christ who's handing you directions as how to be a powerhouse in life and overcome all of your sufferings and say, I don't believe, I'm, I'm going to follow them. Okay? That's the problem. No, no, don't follow. Okay? It's, it's so you pull away from that slander of your own life and pull yourself into understanding it's time to believe Jesus Christ. It's time to believe Buddha and realize that absolute happiness comes only from one place, and that it's within you. Okay? Now listen to this. I want you to, I'm going to conclude this is a statement made by Shakyamuni Buddha. 
Quote, he said, I will tell you this. Changing oneself is the single most difficult feat in the entire universe. Now, he knew, and you know too, because we all agree on this stuff, but you know doggone well, you get home, it's going to be more of the same. Because it takes a lot of disciplining until you're willing to come down, hit the floor, get involved in this, and meditate your way above and beyond all of this junk that these people throw at you. You're going to continue to deal with it. And it is, as he said, the single most difficult thing. And he said too, don't be surprised that it does not come overnight. But it will come. It will come. I'm going to erase this so you don't get thinking. See? Stupidity. And I'll put the eraser right back on the thing. <laughs> Stupidity. Thank you for sharing this time with us. In